Hi, this is Pastor Bill Cornelius. I wanna thank you for watching our YouTube channel. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe while you're here. And if you enjoyed the message, follow me on Instagram and Twitter, where I'm always posting powerful and inspiring content just like today's message. Great to have you guys here after the service. I need you guys to get that bass back in my car when we're done, all right? Thank you. thank you so much. So glad to have you guys here. I want to say hello to all of our campuses. Thanks for being a part of our services. Let's also give, give it up for our God Behind Bars guys real quick. We love you guys. So grateful for you. I'm excited about today's message because I know all of us are dreaming of going higher in our lives. Now, everyone has a different area they want to do that in. Maybe for you, it's your family your walk with the Lord, maybe it's your health, maybe for you it's your business, your investments, your future, your retirement. I don't know what it is for you, but we all have areas that we want to go higher. So I thought today, let's talk about that. So I want to talk today about how you can get into orbit. You know, last week we talked about how, you know, we used to say the sky is the limit until NASA proved that the sky is not the limit, that you can actually go beyond the sky. You can actually get into orbit. It's amazing how the men and women during the Apollo missions did just that with less technology, as we talked about, than you have in your watch or your iPhone today. So if they can do that with the limited capacity that they had at the time, then what are you and I capable of doing today? Far more than you think is the answer. So I want to give you some notes today to write down. So please grab something to write with, or you can also download our Church Unlimited app. All the notes that I'm preaching from are in front of you. You have that app, so please get that. Download that today, or you can take some notes, old school, pen and paper. Either way, I want to encourage you to do so. And so let's say our mission statement together real quick. What are we here to do as a church? We're here to take as many people to heaven as we can before we die, period. That's what we're all about here at Church Unlimited. So many of us are dreaming of something. Maybe for you, you look at someone's marriage and you go, man, they're just... They're, they're just, they're higher. They're like on another plane than we are. They just seem happy and in love and they've been married for years. And somehow they'll be able to keep that honeymoon stage and extend it into decades. How have they been able to do that? Maybe for you, you look at a, maybe you have a friend or a coworker, you go, man, they're just killing it in the office. Their career is just taking off and they're just in orbit. And I feel like I'm trying, but I'm just nowhere near getting off the ground. Or maybe you, maybe you know someone that you go, wow, they just seem so close to God. And it just seems like God's hand is on them in an incredible way. And I just, I want to know what it is to be close to God like that. But I still feel like I'm on the ground. What area of your life is it that you just feel like you want to be in orbit, but you can hardly even get above the clouds? How do you do that? How do you do that? How did the people of NASA do it? And what does God's word have to say about this? I'm going to go back to creation, chapter one of Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible. And we're going to continue to go day by day as God is creating life, how we can launch our life. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter one or your Bible app. Genesis chapter one, starting in verse 14, we're going to pick up here in the fourth day of creation. And we'll just see what God has to say to you and me about getting into orbit. Look at this. Then God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. And that is what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day, the smaller one to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set these lights in the sky to light the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the fourth day. Now, I wanna point out something that may seem kind of obvious to you, but did you notice he doesn't even create the sun and the moon he doesn't create the actual time calendar of our day until day four. You realize that? So that means that the 24-hour clock was kept in his mind before that, because it did say he created this and that, and there was the first day, right? It was good, the first day, then he created this and that, the second day, then the third day. Now we get to the fourth day, we finally get the moon, the stars, and the sun. In other words, he put, he put them in the orbit, he put them in place, and they started their routine. And so this is just the first time we actually have time. So we already had creation before we had time. And the reason I want to point this out is because if you want to be a leader, if you want to go higher in your life than you are now, then there's a real simple answer to this. Would you write this down? If you focus your time and efforts, you get to be the boss. But if you cannot control your time, you will never be in charge of very much. Because the truth is, is that people that go further in their life, they're on a different clock than other people. I mean, in other words, people that are succeeding in their business, I mean, I know that the store says they open at nine, but the people that are succeeding in that business, they're not there at nine, they're there at eight or even seven or even six. The people that are succeeding, you know, we know that it's supposed to take around four to four and a half years uh, to get your college degree, but a lot of people that are successful in education somehow do that in three and a half. Somehow do that in three. So somehow think instead of summer's taking them off, they just continue to go to school. In other words, it's like they're on their own time schedule and it's a better time schedule than than most of us. 
And so they just feel like, it's almost like there's a sense of urgency built into them that they want to accomplish something bigger. I talked to my dad this week. I told you I was going to interview him. And I, I do apologize now for those of you who are ready to see a video. It was a great video, very powerful. I cried in the end, but it's a little longer than we can use in service. So we're putting it on Facebook. So please go check that out. It's a great, very powerful video. But I remember talking to my dad and he said one of the weirdest things about NASA and the whole program in the Apollo missions, he said, we had these arbitrary dates just given to us from the White House. Like, I want this done by this date, this done by that date. And he was like, he said, we don't even know how they picked them out. It's almost like they just threw darts at the board. Like sometime in July of 1960, whatever, have done this, you know? And he said, but we never missed a date. We just somehow, we just knew that date is for real and we're not gonna blow past that. Could it be that you set certain time limits on things and you, but you don't take your own word serious? Like I'm gonna get this done today, but then you let it not get done. I'm gonna get this done by this month or this week, but you just kind of let it blow. You go, eh, it's not a big deal, you know? And so you say, oh, pastor, come on, everyone's not really that good with their time. It's true. But do you want to be like everyone? That's the question you have to ask yourself. For example, did you know, I just want to throw out a couple things. You know, the average American spends two hours and 23 minutes a day on social media. Two hours, almost two and a half hours a day flipping through our phone. That's a long time. That's in a crazy amount of time. You know, the average American spends between four and six hours on, in front of a television whether that's cable, cable news, sports, whatever it happens, maybe it's streaming. You know, you know, with streaming, our time is increased because it always says right below the show you just watched, and the next one starts in five, four, three. And so you're like, oh, might as well, right? So we give it another go, and you look up, and you're six episodes into something that you just started, right? And so we don't realize it, but our time is being eaten away. It's pac manning our life, and we don't even realize it's happening. Maybe if you, time is not the waste of money. Uh, maybe time is not your waste, wasted asset. Maybe money is. Maybe you say, well, man, I, I really want to you know, get into the orbit of, of great investing and, and really having something so that one day when I retire, I actually have something to retire on. I don't want to cut back big time in my life. I mean, I want to be able to you know, live comfortably, that kind of thing. Great. Maybe for you, it's more than that. You say, I don't want to live comfortable. I want to live really well. I want to, I want to be able to take care of my kids and grandkids, and I really want to have something to give to God and to others. And you know, great, that's awesome. But let me just ask you, what are you doing with what you current earn, currently earn? Well, I'm on the one earn that much. I only earn 30, 40 grand, and my spouse only earns 30, 40 grand. Okay, so that's 70 grand between you, and you have nothing left at the end of the year from $70,000? Isn't it fun? Ooh, it got quiet in here. <laughs> it's almost like God is trying to tell us, you do have a lot. It comes in increments, and we're eating all of it up. There's nothing left. And so if you're making fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year as a household income, and you do that for 10 years, that's a half a million dollars. What do you have in the bank from all that? Thousand bucks? Two thousand bucks? So you're in a half a million dollars and you have... See, guys, we have a problem. The problem is not that we don't have opportunity. It's that we are wasting our fuel. And so the one thing I can tell you about the rockets that they use to take men into orbit, men and women into orbit, is that they are very efficient and effective at launch. It's incredible to watch the launches. If just go back on YouTube and watch some of the launches of the Gemini project, the Mercury project, those are the early ones. Then, of course, the Apollo projects. And later on, there was the Challenger, you know, the space shuttle missions. It's incredible to watch them launch. Simply amazing. But let me just ask you something. Could it be that if time and effort and money is your fuel, and it depends on what you want in life, but if those are things that are your fuel, are you leaking fuel and wondering why you're not going higher? You just look at your day. I mean, did you just leak some fuel? You know, I don't know, I'm, I'm not getting advancement in my office. Why are you on YouTube and you're, when your door's closed? What are you doing? What are you, they say 20% of people in America spend up to an hour a day on YouTube in their office. Are you kidding me? You better be being paid to do something on YouTube then. That, that, is, that would just drive me crazy. As, as someone who is an employer as well as a pastor, I, my head wants to spin around hearing that. I'm like, we're trying to win lost people for Christ and you're busy entertaining yourself? So just, let me just ask you, what are your real priorities? Because where you spend your time is where you, your real part. Is it what, do you say this is important to you, but you don't give it any time? Oh, my marriage is important. When's the last time you spent an hour with your spouse not in front of a TV or a movie? Just, just talking, just getting to know one another. Because where you put your time is, is, will determine how your life turns out. 
Just ask that question. Or maybe for you, you say, well, I'm really trying to get somewhere, but I feel like my rocket just keeps firing off and then falling back flat. It just, it's not getting off the ground. Are you watering down your fuel? I mean, just think about that for a second. I mean, you say, man, I really want to have this incredible life and this great marriage and incredible family. And so you're single, you're dating. Yeah, tell me about who you're dating. Oh, they're, they're pretty cool. You know, are they a Christian? Well, uh, oh, so you're just, so can you imagine if they said in NASA, like, well, we didn't have enough fuel to fill the rocket completely, but we just thought, let's just add a little water. It'll be fine. If you water down fuel, it will go nowhere. Could it be that you're watering down the fuel of your life with a lack of integrity, a lack of morality, and you're mixing, as God says, you're mixing the world with him, and you're mixing false idols with the true, the true one God, and you wonder why you're not getting, there's no power in your life because you keep watering down the fuel. God wants to take you higher, but that fuel's gotta be pure. It's gotta be spontaneously explosive. And the only way it's going to happen is you've got to quit adding the wrong ingredients to your life. If you want to go higher, get rid of the things that mess up your fuel. You've got to have pure fuel if you're going to go higher. So I want to challenge you with this. What are you focusing your time and your efforts on? You've got to make sure it's focused in the right direction. How about this one? Can you imagine if they had this rocket full of fuel and they laid it on the ground and then shot it off? I mean, someone would die, right? You'd be like, oh, people will get killed. That would not be safe, right? You always wanna make sure that whatever direction you're trying to go, you point your life in that direction. But you know what we do? We fire off and kind of go this way and then kind of go that way. And you wonder why we're not getting really high. It's because it, it may be, guys, I wanna encourage you with this. It may be that there's nothing wrong with you because we have a tendency to look at other people in orbit and go, what's wrong with me, man? Why is my life not like that? Maybe it's not that there's anything wrong with you. You're just not focused. Point your life in the one direction you want to go and focus all your energy, all your days and nights and efforts and relationships and communication and connections and everything you watch and everything you do and everything you listen to and everything you read in one direction. <coughs> You'll be shocked how high you can go with a little bit of focus. It's incredible what you can do if you figure out what your priorities are. But if you don't know your priorities, you'll launch your rocket this way and then that way and this way and you'll just put whatever fuel you can find and it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. That means you're living an amateur life. It's time to go pro. This is not a little backyard rocket we're trying to fire here. You need to be a pro. I am a part of the national space program. I am an astronaut. I am an engineer. I am a scientist. I put my best efforts in this. We get the calculations right. We run the numbers. We get the ingredients in place, and we launch in one direction. It's incredible what you can do when you take yourself seriously. God takes you seriously. In fact, he takes you so seriously, it's very clear in the scripture. Did you know this? It's very clear in the scripture that he has left the salvation of the world into your hands. Did you know that? He says, I work in and through you. Can I tell you something really shocking? That means God needs you. Well, God doesn't need it. Yeah, God set it up like that. He designed it. He wouldn't have had to do that, but he didn't want to go around you. He doesn't need you to do it, but he wants to use you to do it. Isn't that incredible? And so, listen, I want to encourage you with this. This means you need to start asking God for some more fuel in your life. Don't be afraid to do that. This may surprise you, but I want to encourage you that if you want to do much for God, don't be afraid to ask much from God. Amen. If you want to do much for God, do not be afraid to ask for much from God because he wants to fuel you up so you can do greater and greater things for his glory, for his purposes. God has a lot he wants to accomplish through you. Someone needs to get excited because we're trying to get you in orbit today. God's got more for you to do. I want to encourage you to get with God's program. He's got big things for you. Look at what happens next. Check it out. Then God said, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with the birds of every kind. So God created great sea creatures and every sort of bird, each producing offspring of the same kind. Then God blessed them and saying, be fruitful and multiply. Let the fish fill the seas. Let the birds multiply in the earth, uh, on the earth. And the evening passed and morning came marking the fifth day. So he, what does he do? He doesn't just create a couple of fish. He creates swarms of fish. Isn't that great? All the fishermen said, amen, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he creates swarms of fish, right? I bet when you go fishing, you're really not looking just to catch one fish. I mean, unless it's really one really big one. That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Like one gigantic would be great, but, but I, I want lots of fish, right? If I'm going to spend all this effort, get my tackle box together, get all my gear, go out into the boat, you know, get up early, if I do all that, I'm really, I don't want just one catch. I want to make this worth it, right? I want some multiples here, right? So I want to challenge you to understand the simple concept. The higher you want to go, what you have to do is this. Number two, take whatever it is that you do to a multiple. Oh my God. Take whatever it is you do to multiply. He says, be fruitful in what? Multiply. And so you say, well, Starbucks is amazing. They've, I mean, they're just selling 
coffee by the billions. They're all over the place. It's really just one coffee shop that they got down really well and efficient. And guess what they didn't do? They just multiplied it. Let's just get one coffee shop and do it really efficient and make sure we're profitable. And then let's figure out how to take that one coffee shop and then do two and then do three and do four. And they just multiply. And so they just take a simple coffee shop concept and they took it to a multiple. Our church, you know, go, well, I mean, the church has got thousands of people, this and that. Well, really, it's the same message. Instead of just preaching my guts out one hour a weekend, I thought, let me just add to a second hour and I'll preach it again the third hour and the fourth hour. In the early days, I preached up to six to seven times a day. I would preach until my voice would go out. Why? I was taking the same message and just preaching it to multiple times. You know why I would do that? First of all, I put all this effort to give a message. Why would I just use it once? I mean, why would I just take it and just take it to multiple? And then we figured out, hey, you know what? My voice runs out, but there's this little thing called computers where you can record stuff. And so then we can play it back. And so let's take them to multiple. And we add some campuses and we add services at the campuses. And then we add so, so many services to a campus and we could take all the resources from those two campuses and then we could add a third campus. We're just taking the same message that I've been preaching from 22 years ago this month and just multiplying the results of one simple message that preaches the gospel. That's it. Take what you do. Whatever it is you do, take it to a multiple. Now, let me talk about these rockets. I'm going to put a picture up to show you these rockets. So this is what's called a Titan II rocket. It's on the left side. Do you see that? Now, first of all, the, see the Mercury rockets? Those are down below. There's a little bit. Those, those, that's the first rocket that got a man in orbit right there. It's a Mercury and you see the Mercury's, and then all of a sudden it jumps up into, um, into what's called the Titan rocket. And then from the Titan rocket, the next one it goes to, did you notice the size differential there, is called the Saturn V. Saturn V is what took us, that's the Apollo missions. Apollo 11 in particular that got us to the moon and back was the uh, Saturn V rocket. Let me, just, let me put these in perspective. The Titan II rocket is 109 feet tall. Okay, you think, oh, that's great, that got you in orbit. How do you get to the moon? Well, you shift rockets but you don't go up by little percentage. See, this is the thing. When you look at people that are in orbit and go, man, they must be doing like 20, 30% more than me. No, I'm sorry. I don't mean to embarrass you, but I need to let you in on something. They're not doing 20 to 30% more effort than you. They're doing 1,000% more effort than you and I. I'm not trying to be ugly. I just, you need to understand something. The rocket's size from the Titan II to the Saturn went from 109 feet to 363 feet. It went from 340 pounds to 6.5 million pounds on the rocket. Let me just put that in perspective. Our building, this is the tallest building we have here at Church Unlimited. It's about 30 to 36, story, uh, 30, 30 to 36 feet high, okay? And so this is roughly a three-story building that we're in in an open span auditory that, that I recorded, okay? And so the rocket that the Saturn V rocket, how tall is it? It's 30 stories, it's a 30-story building full of fuel. And then when they launch that fuel, guess how much gas they use? How much fuel? They use a swimming pool of fuel a second. Did you hear that? Just imagine your swimming pool in your backyard, if you have one, just going gone in one second. It uses a swimming pool of fuel a second to get in orbit. But, once that rocket's in orbit, it breaks off. And guess what's left? The, re the rest of the Saturn V, and guess how much it takes once you're in orbit? It runs on the gasoline about the same amount as a large SUV. This is why you look at some people and you go, anything they do just turns to gold. No, 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 they started, it's, you didn't see the early efforts to get them in orbit, but once they're in orbit, you know, then you know, a big company adds one little product and it sells 10 you know, million of something small. How can you do that? Because they're in orbit. Once you're in orbit, it's, it's, it's different than, than, than when you're not in orbit. And so that's the difference. So, so what we do is we tend to judge someone's marriage and go, wow, look at that guy barely just gets his wife the door of every once in a while. And she's so in love with him, it's ridiculous. I mean, look at that. And you're like, no, 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 no. You're judging that marriage, it's in orbit. What you didn't see or weigh into what you're viewing is the early years of sacrifice that that man and woman poured into each other so that now it takes very little to get those good, loving feelings going. But you better put in the early work. And if you don't do that, you wonder why you're not getting off the ground. It's because you're looking at someone in, a, in stage 30 years into their ministry or 20 years into their career or 10 years into their education and so, but you got to look and just realize that they're at a different spot now. So it seems like everything you do just takes them so much further, but it, it took a lot of fuel 
to get off the ground. Could it be that you keep trying to launch your life and you're just like, I'm going to give it an extra 10%. Ready? Oh, I, mean, I think I was higher. Was I higher? I mean, oh, no, no. It's not going to get me there, is it? You have to add massive fuel to your life if you want to go further and faster than ever before. You know, I would just think about our campuses. When we first started opening campuses, after we got this one open, we started opening campuses, and we would spend $150,000, and that was a lot of money. I was like, Phew, that's crazy. I mean, I don't know how we're going to do this, and we would just, I would just say, just go rent a room somewhere in some town, and uh, you know what? We'll go cheaper. If we go to smaller towns, it's cheaper to rent rooms there, and those people need Jesus too, so we'll go to a small town. I have nothing wrong with small towns. We have campuses in small towns, no problem. But we would just kind of go cheap, and so we'd rent a room, and, and, and we'd buy some equipment and put up a screen, and we'd record the, the message on a DVD, and we'd drive it over and play it, and we'd have chairs and you know, all that. And so we'd spend probably $150,000, and then we'd wonder why, well, I mean, it's okay. It's, you know, there's maybe 100 people coming to church, and that's great, but we're putting a lot of effort in to keep this thing going because it's just not really launching like it needs to launch. Because this one thing I know about church planting, because we plant a lot of churches, campuses are very similar, is that churches survive or die just like babies survive or die based upon birth weight. So you have to get it to a certain size. So it's what? So it's viable. So I didn't realize it's the campuses, but for some reason it didn't connect because I knew that with church planting, we had to get up and get going as fast as we could and get as large as we can. So there's enough people to make this thing go and then we can turn it into a church. And so, and I knew that we had a crowd. We didn't have a church. I had to convert that into a church. I get that. But we still had to have enough people, right? So we did these campuses and just, they just weren't working. And then I had to do the really painful thing of closing a few. It was very painful on many of you that were involved with those and certainly on us because you guys were letting us know that you were not happy and it was not fun. So I was like, how do you do this? So I got a mentor who really understood how to do campuses. And he said, okay, I think you should launch a campus just across town. Why don't you pray about where God will lead you? And I, I happened to drive around a particular area called Rodfield. And I was driving around this area and there were home developments going up everywhere. And I was driving as I was driving, I, I finally got out of the car and began to walk. And God just began to speak to me about that area. And so then I thought, let's do this, but there's no buildings to even rent over there. Land, with, land and locations were much more expensive in the city than it was in small towns. And so we just said, okay, I guess we're just going to have to just build a building without even having a campus yet, without even having a church, because there's just nowhere to meet. So we went from spending $150,000 to spending $7.5 million. Now, do you consider that a 10, 20% increase? No, that is a multiplied increase. And guess what? It's working great. Rodville's doing really well. Then we turned around and said, this is really working. What if God could do this in San Antonio? Now, do you think land's cheaper or more expensive in San Antonio? <laughs> Right? So then we have to get land and you got to break ground and go to all this kind of, I mean, it was, oh, and so five years into having a, a group meeting in a school, I mean, week after we're just trying to keep this thing going, it was so difficult. Oh my goodness. And finally, I had to decide either we're going to spend it or we're not going to spend it because I kept looking for deals. I'm going to find a deal. And this is what I've learned about deals. Listen very carefully. There is no discount on greatness, Amen. there are no sales on greatness. Yeah, I could have found a cheaper building and it would have been a cheaper building with a bad location that no one can find. And we wouldn't have people coming because they wouldn't even drive by even see the building. So we did the exact opposite. I realized, you know what? We went from $150,000 to $7.5 million investment with multiple staff members day one. We, we did the same thing, except this time we, we spent $13.5 million in Stone Oak. And guess what? It's going great. We're in orbit. It works. But that is scary. Now listen, 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 listen. I spent several years fighting the price. Anybody else done that in your life? You fought the price for several years? And the whole time I was fighting the price, I could have already been building. So you got to get this in your spirit. Figure out what the price of greatness is for you and just get busy paying it. Because you're going to pay a price either way. Either you're going to pay a price to get what you want or you're going to pay a price of regret having never gone for it. Either way, you're going to pay a price. So get busy putting the fuel in the rocket to go higher. You can do more. You can do far more than you ever dreamed is possible. You got to shift gears. Either you're going to pay the price in effort or you're going to pay the price in regret. Either way, you're going to pay the price. So I want to challenge you to pay the price in effort and you can launch. You can go into orbit. You can go higher and faster than you ever thought possible. It's going to take a lot more than you think. Listen, I got good news for you. It's going to take longer than you think. It's going to be harder than you think. It's going to be more price, pricey than you ever thought. But guess what? It's going to be greater results than you ever thought. So if you get busy paying the price, great things can happen. But there is no such thing as success without paying the price. No discounts on greatness. They don't exist. Either you pay the full price or you don't get the results. It's that simple. Pay the price.
Then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. And that, whoa, 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 like, like us? What, what God, what, what's like us mean? The Trinity was there. This is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Isn't that cool? He said, I want to make you like, like us. I love that. Did you know you weren't meant to go it alone as a Christian? God himself, his very character is community. So if you think you're supposed to be some lone ranger Christian, and I'll occasionally watch a YouTube video of church, and I'll just read my Bible and watch on my own, and I'll just go out in the wilderness, and that'll be my time with God, and then you wonder why your life's falling apart. We need true community. It's great. Hey, have time with God in the woods. I'm all for it, but that doesn't mean you separate yourself from the herd. Sheep that separate themselves from the herd get eaten by lions. You want to stay with the herd. We need community. Keep going. Let's check it out what happens next. Then they will reign over the fish in, in the sea. So God says, let's make humans in our image. And he says, they will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth. And all my hunters said, amen. Right? Yes. It says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. What does this mean? He says, hey, I'm going to create man and woman, and I want them to dominate all the animals and all creation whether it's the sky, the sea, uh, animals on the ground, or whether it's the plants, the, all of it. In other words, God's saying that I want you to dominate whatever I've given you. So what does that mean? Number three, you were created to dominate. You were not created to get by. You were created to dominate. You were not created to barely make it through school. You were created to dominate school. Why don't you this semester go in with the mindset, I'm not gonna just do my homework and pass. I'm gonna dominate the material. I'm gonna know it one way and the other, and my professor's gonna be like, who is this guy? What got into him? I can tell you what got into you. Purpose, plans, the promise that God has for you. When if you look at it that way, you'll begin to dominate what's in front of you rather than just barely getting by. You were not meant to get by. You were meant to dominate that project that you're so overwhelmed with, why don't you just put some more hours into it and dominate it, run it, dominate your territory. Don't just sell cars, dominate the market where you live. Don't just get by in, in the area that, that you know, dominate it, know the product up and down better than anyone. I asked my dad one time, dad, how in the world did you stay at the same company for 30 years in a very competitive company? He said, I knew the product up and down. I said, oh, that's awesome. So they really rely on the fact that you knew the product. He goes, well, it was partly that. I said, well, what else was it? He said, it was also partly that they knew I knew the product so well, I didn't need a notebook to go rebuild it off my brain, which means the competitor could hire me and I could rebuild everything I knew here. <laughs> Dominate. He's just like, hey, pay me one way or pay me the other. You're going to pay me. I know my product and I can rebuild it in my mind if I have to. That's called dominating, saying, I get it. I know where I'm at. I know what God called me to do. And I know the territory he's given me. I'm here to dominate what God has given me. <laughs> dominate. You are not supposed to just get by. Let me ask you something. Are you dominating your time or is your time being dominated by useless things? Are you dominating? Make plans. Stick to those plans. God can do great things through you. Hey, next week, by the way, don't miss the message. Kind of a completion of this. We're going to go through the rest of the, of the creation. But next week, I want to share with you the hidden secret to completing your mission. A lot of people get stuck on the next point. Don't miss next week because a lot of people are hurting and wondering what is the solution and it's actually fairly simple, yet profound. Don't miss next week. The hidden key to completing your mission is next week. You don't want to miss it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. Then God said, look, I have given you, he says, I've, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as a food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Everything that has life. And that is what happened. And, uh, then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, marking the sixth day. So this is cool. So this is like this is creation, right? He says, hey, I've given you, all the animals are for years. God's saying in a nice way, those are for you to eat. <laughs> that's for you. That's, that's your meal, okay? See the things just walk along? Yeah, that's dinner right there. Go kill dinner. That's dinner, you know, right? And so, and he, he, he tells the animals, oh, all those trees and all that fruit and all the stuff, all the vegetation, that's for you to eat. So you eat that and get fattened up. Then the man comes along, kills you, and then we have dinner, okay? This is called the circle of life. I wonder if like there's a Disney song going on that he was doing this, right? It would have been really cool, you know? I love that whole circle of life song, you know? It sounds real cute until you actually see real circle of life when a big animal kills a small animal, you know, and it's not so cute. You know, and you're like, yeah, I don't really hear Elton John in the background during that. That's just kind of violent, right, you know? But that's a real circle of life. He says, we are at the top of the food chain. But I love there's just a hidden truth in here. He says, I have given you every seed-bearing plant. He says, I've given this to you. This is important. People that succeed. We have a tendency to, to, to have a fault. All of us do this. And we do it out of jealousy. 
But we don't even realize we're doing it, but this is what we do. We look at someone who has something we want, and we say, well, if I would have had that opportunity, I could have that too. I mean, yeah, they're rich, but you know, they were just handed that business. As if every kid whose parents own the business are suddenly rich in 20 years. It's not true, is it? There's plenty of kids who don't do anything with that advantage, right? But there's a handful of them that learn the business, work in it early on, work hard, get, learn, to, learn the disciplines of the business. And you think learning the business is the key? Oh, no, no, no. There's plenty of people doing that same business. The reason your family's business is succeeding is because you don't need to learn your mama and your daddy's knowledge. You need to learn your mama and your daddy's work ethic. And if you'll get that, then you can apply that to this business or when that goes out of style, start a new one. So the point is this, we all have advantages. This week, Dwayne The Rock Johnson's father passed away. I'm sure it's a very sad week for him, very difficult. You know what surprised me and yet didn't surprise me is when they show a picture of him. And it looks a lot like Dwayne, but guess what? He was wearing a wrestling outfit. Huh, who knew Dwayne The Rock Johnson's dad was a wrestler? Oh, well, that'll kind of help you get into wrestling, won't it? If your daddy knows all the people that hire everyone, for the wrestling federation that he worked for in the 80s. Won't that kind of help you get in? Now, I'm not making an excuse for Dwayne Rock Johnson. I think he's done pretty well in life. And there's plenty of other wrestlers' kids that did not do well. And yet he got into the business. He didn't just get into the business. What did he do? He dominated the business, did far more than his daddy ever did. Then he parlayed that into one of the most successful acting careers of all time. In fact, just two years ago, he was the highest paid actor in the world. So I think he's taken an advantage that he was given and done very well with it. Would you agree? So before you start to point to someone else who's got something you want to say, well, if I had the advantage they did, just remember there's someone behind you pointing and saying, you have advantages. Have you taken advantage of your advantages? We all have advantages. Oh, Bill's easy for you to get up and talk about family. You had this godly dad and godly mom. You're right. It's a huge advantage. And I'm so glad I took advantage of the advantage rather than blew it off. Make sense? Well, I don't have those advantages. Really? Because last time I checked, you're in here in America which means that your economy, with the same skill set that someone else could have in the Middle East, you'll make 100 times what they'll earn yearly if you'll just barely apply yourself compared to them killing themselves in a horrible market. So you have an engineer, for example, in Mexico versus an engineer in America, what's the difference in income and opportunities? You, you, you know, you're, you're, you're really good with your hands and, you, and you're skilled, and so you can use those skills in a plant somewhere in China, or you can use those skills here in America, and, and who does better financially? Who gets treated better? I hate to break it to you, but I don't want to hear your sob story. You have advantages all around you. And that's the sweetest thing I'm saying all day. And here's why. Because people all the time say, well, I just don't have any advantages. Yes, you do. You know, in our country, if you can't afford school, they'll let you go for free. There's no reason for you not to have schooling. There's no reason for you not to be educated. You can literally go for free if you don't have the money. And so there's just, there's advantage after advantage after advantage. And those of you who say, well, you know what? That sounds great, Pastor. But my life has been horrible. My family has been a train wreck. You have no idea what they've gone through. You know, I have friends who have gone through the same thing. You know what's funny? They see an advantage in it. I just, I, you, you may say, well, uh, I thought you were gonna have compassion and, and care for me. You know what? Enough people have cried on your shoulder with you as you cried. How's that working for you? You said you wanna get in orbit. You gotta get over the things that have happened to you and get focused on the mission. <laughs> I don't mean to be insulting. I'm trying to help you. And so I want to challenge you with this. In fact, you know, some of the best dads I know had horrible fathers. Did you know that? I know some dads that had virtually no dad in their life and they're amazing parents now. Why? Because there's a huge advantage in that. See, I have an advantage having a great mom and dad to watch what it looks like. Maybe your advantage is that you got an up close and personal look at what not to do. That can be a great advantage too, can it? You ever had a friend or a family member that maybe there was an older brother or sister that was a disaster in their decisions? It's amazing to look at the next one down and how successful they are. It's almost like they said, I'm not going to do that. Look what happened to them. It's a great advantage, isn't it? Right? And so I have some friends like that. They're like, oh, my brother's a disaster. And I want to make sure I don't go down that path. And so rather than flirting with stupidity, which is what most of us do, he saw his older brother go full into stupidity and it cost him his life, his marriage, his career, everything. And he thought, I'm not even gonna flirt with it. I'm gonna go the exact opposite and run from that stuff so I can become stronger and do more than I ever thought possible. What I'm trying to tell you is this, inside your adversity is a seed of advantage. Inside your adversity is a seed of advantage. 
there's a successful speaker that travels the world and he, he gives talks and he's really good at what he does. And I've always watched him from afar at his success. He makes about $120,000 an hour when he speaks. It's not a preacher. <laughs> Preachers do not make that. <laughs> this guy's a professional speaker. He speaks to corporations, large audiences all across the world. And I love this part of his story. He always says, you know, the reason why I think that I earn what I earn is because I grew up with nothing and my mom and my dad were totally broke, eventually divorced. I never saw my dad much at all. Uh, and I remember people at Christmas time bringing me gifts because we couldn't afford gifts. And as a little kid, I was so embarrassed by it. I said, I will never, ever have a money problem in my life. Served him well, didn't it? Sometimes your disadvantage can become an advantage. It's all in how you look at it. So maybe you've gone through some things. Well, now you know what not to do because you've already done it and it didn't work, right? So now you know what not to do. You already know how to fail college, right? So you probably do the opposite and probably succeed. You already know how to fail at marriage. Now maybe the next one can be amazing, right? You already know how to fail in your career. Well, how, about, how about applying the exact opposite and learning how to succeed in your career? We already know how to run from God. Why don't we learn how to run to God? God has big plans for your life. He wants to do great things in you. Some of you right now think, hey, Pastor, this is great, but I'm not really a big goal setter, and you're talking about all these big dreams and big plans. That's fine. I've found that there's two types of people in the world. There's goal setters and problem solvers. And so you can look at it two ways. You can either say, I want to point myself to the moon, and I'm going to go to the moon, or you can say, I just want to get off the ground. I, want to, I have the problem of being on the ground, and I want to solve that problem. Either way, it's going to take you the same direction. So you just pick how you view it. You may be running from what you don't want, or you may be running to what you do want. Either way, it's going to take you in the right direction. I just want to challenge you to begin to apply yourself. It's incredible what God can do through you. Number four, take advantage of all that God has given you. Look around and just ask God, what have you given me? What advantage do I have? What unusual access do you not deserve yet you have? Think about that for a second. Years ago, I remember thinking like, why do these pastors give me the time of day? Guys that shouldn't be hanging out with me. And God began to speak to me and say, because I'm showing you what you can become. And so God will give you access to some. Maybe you, you, you have a very wealthy uncle and, and, and you're like, man, I don't know why I, he gives me the time of day, but he does. And, and you know, I can take him to lunch anytime. So you haven't already taken him to lunch? Ask him how he's done it? Why would you not do that? How many people would love to be able to do that? Maybe you have a friend that's really successful in some area that you really want what they have. Why have you not asked them what they've done? Access their success. Access the steps they've taken and learn from it. Take advantage of the advantage that God has given you. We all have advantages. The question is, are you taking advantage of your advantage or are you taking for granted your advantage? Which one is it? And as I close up this message, maybe you've been coming here for weeks, months, or years. Or maybe you've only been here one or two times, but you've heard preachers preach before. And at the end of all their messages, they always do the same thing. And you're used to it. You already know what's coming. But have you taken advantage of the fact that preachers at the end of their message want to give you an opportunity to meet the God of the universe, the God who created you, the God who has a purpose and a plan for your life. Have you taken advantage of that yet? Or have you been taking that for granted all along as if you'll just always have time? Maybe it's time to take advantage of this moment to make Christ your Lord, to make Jesus your friend, to make the God of the universe that created it all for you someone who is personal in your life. Would you bow your heads with me and every, every head bowed, every eye closed, and we take a moment. Would you take advantage of this opportunity? Please don't take this for granted because you may not always have a chance to give your life to Christ. With your head bowed, with your eye closed, this is your time, this is your moment to give your life to Christ. Pray this prayer with me. You can say, dear Jesus, I realize I need you. I believe you died for my sin and I believe you rose again. I ask you to come into my heart, be my Lord and be my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you just pray that prayer, maybe your prayer today is to say, God, I want a greater year this year than ever before. I want to get into orbit. Then I want to challenge you to begin to make plans, not plans to increase 10, 20%. No, 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 no. You need way more fuel than that. Say, God, show me where the fuel is. Show me how to have increased focus. Show me how to pour more in and help me, Lord, to begin to deposit the price because greatness never comes cheap. God, I want that in my life and my marriage and my family and my walk with you and my health and my career. I want to see your greatness. So I commit to putting in the time, putting in the fuel, focusing my life. Thank you, Lord, for your word is so true. Thank you, Lord, that you've shown me how I can get into orbit just like others. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Isn't God good?
His word is so true.